This is Jesse Lacasse, yes. is that correct? <laughs> um, well, Jesse was an attendee at 2014 AHS in Berkeley, and thanks to him attending back in 2014, it uh, now informs his work today. So it had such a huge influence on him, and they'll be talking about a pill that Darwin never saw coming. Hi everyone, I'm Jesse Lacasse, and uh, I'm coming to you from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Um, I'm coming from Concordia University in the Center for Studies in Behavioral Neurobiology. I'm gonna be presenting to you today, as Daryl mentioned, the pill that Darwin never saw coming, the impact of hormonal contraceptives on the brain. Before we start, I just wanna let everyone know that I'm gonna post all of my slides and references online so you can all have access to that. As a graduate student, I just plan to don't make money. Um, I have no conflicts of interest and nothing to disclose, and this is certainly not medical advice. The pill. Despite the fact that there are so many different pills for every kind of ailment that you can imagine, there's only one pill that we call the pill, and that's birth control or hormonal contraceptives. So what makes this pill so spectacular? Well, when this pill was released, it was revolutionary for women and really for all of humanity. So, but the story of the pill doesn't start when it was released in public, because no drug is really that interesting unless it has an endogenous system to bind to. Now, all drugs work similarly in that they have this kind of ligand receptor action. The drug binds to a receptor, kind of like a key unlocks a lock. You need the special kind of key to unlock a certain lock. So this is kind of how all drugs work. The same is true about steroid hormones. What's a steroid hormone? Steroid hormones are these molecules that are derived from cholesterol, broken down through a series of enzymatic processes to form hormones that you might be familiar with, like progesterone, testosterone, estradiol. Now, just like drugs, these steroid hormones have to bind at steroid hormone receptors. So as an example here, we've got estradiol here coming in and binding at its little estrogen receptor, like the little lock and key stuff that we were just talking about. So as an example then, let's pull up a cell here. And on the membrane is a uh, membrane estrogen receptor. Now, steroid receptors can either be on the cell membrane, but they could also be found within the cell's cytoplasm. Now, when estrogen comes in and binds to this steroid receptor, it can alter uh, certain intracellular signaling cascades or maybe protein synthesis. And downstream of that, that's going to change things like energy metabolism or maybe the membrane potential. It might signal for the cell to grow or repair itself. And it could even trigger uh, programmed cell death. Now, depending on where this cell finds itself within an organism and whether it's surrounded by a bunch of other hormonally sensitive cells, the role of hormones on uh, regulating certain cellular processes can become more and more complex. These are super, super old machinery, these estrogen receptors or steroid receptors in general. They're found in some of the earliest vertebrates that we know. So they've been around for a very long time. And over evolutionary time, as organisms became more and more complex, the role of steroid hormones and what they were regulating also became more complex. So then if we fast forward through evolutionary time and we end up here at the human menstrual cycle, you can see that the role of hormones became really complex over evolutionary time. You get these, you get these changes in uh, fluctuating hormone levels that'll result in a whole bunch of physiological processes that change uh, within the endometrium, for example. So if this cell that's sensitive to estrogen or progesterone finds itself located in the human endometrium lining, maybe that cell's responsible for responding to changes in estrogen and progesterone levels, and that will actually alter, for example, the thickness of the lining, or maybe vascular or immune processes there. So over evolutionary time, these were shaped, and you can see that it's very complicated, but Imagine then, if you think that it's complicated, all of these things being regulated within the endometrium, well, if you found yourself as one of these estrogen or progesterone sensitive cells within the brain, things can get a lot more messy. So these are the female rat brain. It's a heat map showing you the relative distribution of estrogen receptors, different types of them across the, rat, the female rat brain, only to show you here that estrogen receptors, as well as all other steroid receptors, are quite abundant throughout the brain, meaning that they can regulate uh, processes that are underlied by the brain, of course. If you look at the human menstrual cycle, you see that there's fluctuations in estrogen levels and progesterone levels across a roughly 28-day cycle, okay? And so what you see, if you look carefully then, for example, at brain structure, 
is that across this 28-day cycle, there's going to be subtle changes in the brain such that across these uh, 28 days, you'll see that there's changes in the shape and the size, uh, roughly speaking, of the brain. Now, the same is true of functional activity. You might observe that there's differences in terms of glucose metabolism in, var in various brain regions. You might see that there's changes in blood flow or blood oxygenation. And this all is pinned up to these fluctuations in hormones in women. Now, something you might be more familiar with, the cognitive and emotional processes also change across the, uh, the menstrual cycle. So all of this to say that over evolutionary time, as women were exposed to these fluctuations in steroid hormones, certain processes in the brain and cognitive functions were kind of tacked onto that over the course of evolution. Now, this is the underlying process that we think might be real, related to a lot of this. This is a, a finding from Woolley and McEwen in 93. What they found here is that actually the neuron, the brain cell, is uh, sensitive to fluctuations in estrogen and progesterone. So again, this is a neuron in a female rat brain. On the left here, we've got the neuron, and branching out from it are these things called dendrites. Now these dendrites are actually reaching out, trying to form a connection with another neuron's dendrite so that they can connect with each other and form a network of neurons. This is basically the, under, uh, the underlying process under learning and memory. If this goes awry, you see a lot of problems, especially uh, in neuropsychiatric conditions. Now, if you look carefully here at the dendritic spines, you'll see that there's these little stubs that are reaching out from them. These are called dendritic spines. These are finger-like protrusions that are reaching out, and these are actually the uh, little points that are going to form the synapse if the dendrites end up connecting with one another from two different neurons. And so what you see is that there's actually fluctuations, whoop, there's fluctuations here in the number of dendritic spines that are forming across the female rat estrus cycle, such that when they have high levels of estradiol circulating, they have more of these dendritic spines, and you actually see improvements in learning and memory and stuff like that. Now, in the estrus phase, when you get this rise in progesterone, what you see then is that you get this stripping away of these dendritic spines. And so all of this to show is even at the level of the neuron, the neuron is sensitive to these fluctuations in estrogen and progesterone. So, now let's take a step back and let's make a timeline here. We've got all of human evolution and all of hominid evolution, if you really want to think about it, even further back than that. But where women would have been exposed to these cyclic fluctuations in estradiol and progesterone and other various hormones, but over all of evolutionary time, they would have been exposed to this, uh, these cyclic changes. Now, then, in 1960, what you see is that we flip this whole system on its head, and the United States approves the birth control pill uh, as a contraceptive. Now, <clears throat> this is revolutionary, because for women, this really propelled them to, uh, this was really what led to the women's uh, liberation movement, and allowed them to enter the workforce, and really have access to higher education. But it also gave them a choice over the number of offspring that they would actually be able to have, and so it was really revolutionary for women's health in that sense. However, we've now gone through all of evolutionary time with these exposures to these cyclic changes in hormones and all of these processes at the level of the brain and cognitive function that's associated with those changes, and yet we flipped the system on its head in 1960. So I like to juxtapose the release of the hormonal contraceptive pill with this fact in 1968, which is the discovery of the estrogen receptor in the female rat brain by Don Pfaff. And so what you see is that it, I like to juxtapose these two facts next to each other because it really shows you where the thinking was in terms of neuroendocrinology at the time of the release of the birth control pill. We discovered the estrogen receptor in the brain eight years after it was released into the public. So we just weren't thinking really about the brain necessarily at the time of its release. So let's continue our timeline then, and we end up here in 2019 with the release of this graph from the United Nations showing the different types of contraceptive methods that are used around the globe. If you look carefully here, you'll see that about half of the methods include a hormone in them. One that you'll be more familiar with, obviously, the pill, but there's other forms like injectable methods or implantable methods, as well as intrauterine devices that can either be hormonal or copper. Now, this figure actually doesn't uh, break up between hormonal IUDs and copper IUDs, but if we take about half the number there, that gives us an estimate that about 250 to 300 million women around the globe are using hormonal contraceptives. And this number is growing as the drugs become generic and as they enter countries that didn't have access to them before. So what is the pill? Well, like you saw on the last slide, the pill's not just one thing. There's no one entity that is the pill. 
there can be a lot of different forms of the pills, and really what uh, the combined oral contraceptive pill is that everyone's familiar with would be a combination of a synthetic form of estrogen and a synthetic progesterone molecule. Now, the most frequently used estrogen in hormonal contraceptives is something called ethanyl estradiol. This is a very potent estrogen. It has twice the binding affinity for an uh, estrogen receptor than does the endogenous 17-beta estradiol. Now, in addition to that, it has about 100 times the biological activity that you see with 17-beta estradiol. Now, if you look at the progestins that are used in hormonal contraceptives, what you first notice is that there's a whole bunch of them. So to try and build a framework around how to think about these progestins, there's one way to think about it, which is how are they derived? Well, if they're derived from a synthetic form of testosterone, like 19 nor testosterone, what you'll see is they actually carry with them this androgen or testosterone-like effect. They have binding affinities for androgen receptors, and they can carry with them these effects that you might expect of the androgens, like DHT or of testosterone. Now, if they're synthesized, whoa. Oh God, here we go. Okay, if they're synthesized from an, uh, a synthetic form of progesterone, well then what you see is that they actually, oh, what is going on here? You actually see that they carry with them these anti-androgenic effects, where they have an, uh, effects that oppose those of the androgens, or maybe might be more similar to what you observe with estrogens. The general mechanism of action uh, for hormonal contraceptives. It doesn't apply to all forms of them, but the vast majority work in this way. So in a naturally cycling woman, what you'd have is gonadotropin-releasing hor gonadotropin hormone would be released from the hypothalamus to stimulate the pituitary to release follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. These will travel down to the ovaries, which will stimulate the release of estrogens, and eventually it'll stimulate the release of progesterone downstream from that. Now, with hormonal contraceptives, we close off this feedback loop by saying to the hypothalamus, listen, we've got a whole bunch of estrogen and progesterone on board here. We don't need to make any more. And so you get this reduction in ovarian hormones and gonadotropin hormones uh, as a result of the hormonal contraceptives. So then keeping this mechanism in mind, how do hormonal contraceptives impact the brain? Well, let's start by looking at brain structure and function. Starting with brain structure. Well, there's a lot of changes that they observe in terms of brain structure relative to natural cycling women uh, with hormonal contraceptive users. However, what you see is that some studies report that there's larger gray matter volume in certain parts of the brain, and then other studies report that there's smaller gray matter volume in other parts of the brain. Now, I've underlined here a couple of different brain regions that show that depending on which study you read, you actually get the direction of the effect going in opposite directions here. So the jury's really still out in a lot of ways. Now, a recent study that came out in PLOS One showed that uh, using a really uh, highly high-resolution uh, type of MRI showed that there was a total volume reduction uh, in the hypothalamus and pituitary gland of women using hormonal contraceptives okay, compared to naturally cycling women, which is interesting for the reasons uh, I, or related to the mechanism that I just showed you. Um, so you get this uh, less total volume in hypothalamic and uh, pituitary gland tissue. So moving on to brain function then, the two ways that we tend to think about brain function is resting state, the brain at rest, or during a task, during a cognitive task, or while the brain is doing something, and you want to see if there's changes in functional activation. Now, in terms of resting state and task-based uh, assessments, what we see is mixed results and no differences. What do I mean? Well, in terms of mixed results, you see that hormonal contraceptive users in some cases have higher levels of functional activity in various brain regions, either at rest or during a task, and then the opposite is also found depending on which study you read. So the effect of hormonal contraceptives on the brain uh, in terms of structure and function is complicated. Let me explain why. Now let's say you want to run a study to assess the effect of hormonal contraceptives on the brain. What do you do? It's not necessarily, it's been done, but it's not necessarily ethical to randomly distribute people to receive a contraceptive hormone. And so what you get then is that we all recruit these types of uh, convenience samples. Well, who are you recruiting? Are you recruiting anybody on a hormonal contraceptives? I hope I've shown you that there's not just one thing that is a hormonal contraceptive. And so do you have IUD, uh, people with IUDs, as well as uh, implants? Are you including people who have uh, using androgenic forms versus anti-androgenic forms? Are you throwing them all into one group? So that's part of the problem. Are you comparing them when they're using the active pill or the sugar pill? Are you looking at people who started using them when they were adolescents, or are you looking at adult onset users? 
There's other studies that also just look at women who experience negative mood effects of the pill, and they only look at those women. So there's a lot of really cool findings out there in the brain structure and function literature. However, they test all of these really unique samples and, you know, not necessarily a single type of uh, contraceptive hormone. And so it's really hard to weave the needle and try to get this kind of global effect of what's going on to brain structure and function. However, we do see that relative to naturally cycling women, there are changes in brain structure and function. It's just that we don't necessarily have a good uh, finger on the pulse in terms of which direction those effects are going in just yet. If we do observe these effects in structure and function though, maybe you'd expect that there would be an effect on cogn cognitive function or cognition. Okay. Remember earlier I told you that a progestin, depending on how it's derived, can actually come from uh, synthetic forms of progesterone or testosterone. So they can either be androgenic or anti-androgenic. Well, it turns out the best way to think about the effect of androgenic and anti-androgenic hormones on cognition is by thinking about them through the lens of cognitive sex differences. And so what do I mean by that? So it turns out that there's a whole bunch of cognitive processes that in some cases, males excel, and in other cognitive processes, women excel. So for example, men are really, really good at these visuospatial tasks, like mental rotation, for example, where you have to rotate this 3D object in your mind and match it up with a couple of different options. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, women are really, really good at these cognitive processes like uh, emotional facial recognition. So if you were to give a woman uh, this um, image here, her reaction time would be a lot more quick and she'd be a lot more accurate at recognizing those emotions than a male. Now, let's take mental rotation then as an example uh, for how these uh, androgenic and anti-androgenic hormones work. So here's a... Uh, block here, and I'd like you to rotate it in your mind and match it up with either option A, B, or C. Okay, so for those of you who chose option C, this is the correct answer. <laughs> A lot of you look disappointed, especially the men. Um, okay, so... Um, so what do we see with mental rotation and hormonal contraceptives? Well, what you see is that if you give an androgenic form of these hormonal contraceptives, then, well, it slides performance towards this male phenotypic end of the spectrum where you see this lower reaction time and higher increases in accuracy. Now, with women, it's a little bit more complicated. Or I start to say, with females, it's a bit more complicated. So what you see in naturally cycling women is that women with higher levels of, uh, of estradiol actually show worse improvement, on, or sorry, worse performance on a mental rotation task, lower re reaction to, or slower reaction times, less accuracy. So it's driving them towards that female pheno phenotypic end of the spectrum. Now, if you look at ethanol estradiol, the hormone in, or the, uh, the synthetic form of estrogen, as you drive up that dose of ethanol estradiol, what you see is that it actually drives you towards this female phenotypic end of the spectrum as well. Now, if you look at uh, this study here, which along the x-axis, this is the angle at which the block is turning. So it's getting harder and harder. So what you could see is that accuracy in all groups is declining as they make the task harder. But what you see is that males are having the highest level of accuracy, followed by naturally cycling women. And women using anti-androgenic forms of hormonal contraceptives are all the way at the far end of this fem female phenotypic uh, end of the scale where they have the highest reaction times and the, less, uh, the least accuracy. Now, it turns out that this actually applies to several other cognitive tasks. In my own work, I've actually shown that uh, the this applies to 3D navigation as well. So males tend to complete these mazes a lot more quicker, uh, quickly. They learn the uh, environment a lot more quickly. And what you see is that if you give an androgen, or women using an androgenic form of hormonal contraceptives will tend to have lower latencies depending on the uh, form that they're using, uh, some latencies that are exactly what we observe in men. Another uh, form of cognition that I briefly mentioned before is this social cognition, facial recognition, facial emotional recognition. This is something that we probably take for granted a lot of the time, but you'd really want to be able to tell the difference that these are two different people. And if you knew them, you'd want to be able to look at their face and recognize who they were as an individual. In addition to that, you'd want to be able to see the emotion on their face and recognize what that might mean. 
And so as I mentioned, females really excel at this. They can really detect in a shorter reaction time and highly more accurately what the emotion is on these face. Now, if you give an and or women taking an androgenic form of the hormonal contraceptive, you can see where the story is going. They get or yeah, they get worse at this, more towards the male phenotypic end of the spectrum. And there's actually this other finding that women using hormonal contraceptives tend to have this bias towards negatively valenced stimuli. So they'd be a lot more quick at reacting to this uh, negative face, the angry face, uh, versus reacting to the happy face. And so they seem to have this bias towards negatively valenced stimuli. Now, in terms of executive functions, uh, from my own work as well, this is stuff that we've found, was that, sure, the androgenic uh, forms of hormonal contraceptives drive performance towards this male end of the spectrum, but what you need to do is look at whether they're taking the active or sugar pill, and you see that the effect that we observed only occurs if they're taking the active pill, not the sugar pill, meaning that there might be kind of short-lived effects on cognitive function as it relates to taking these hormones. That being said, a couple of studies that have come out in the past 10 years or so have shown that there might be benefits for cognitive uh, function in the long term for women who have used hormonal contraceptives. What they showed was that uh, these uh, improvements in cognitive function were actually duration dependent, such that women using hormonal contraceptives for greater than 15 years actually had better performance on these cognitive tasks, rel had the greatest performance, I would say, uh, on cognitive tasks relative to women uh, who never used them. Now, two other studies out of China had come out recently showing that uh, there was a decreased risk for cognitive impairment in women above the age of 60 using hormonal contraceptives compared to those who had never used them. Okay. Let's get into mental health. And I'm gonna double click on depression here because this is the area that's received the most attention as it relates to the link between hormonal contraceptives and mental health. In 2016, in JAMA Psychiatry, this paper came out as, uh, showing an association between hormonal contraceptives and depression. Now, this paper and some others have received quite a bit of criticism. Down here in the reference section here, I know you can't really see them too well, um, there are four reviews here that really attack the literature uh, on hormonal contraceptives and depression, so I want to make sure that that is included in your uh, reading after the fact. But uh, really the issue is uh, essentially the absolute risks are a lot less impressive than the relative risks. But Overall, what you do see is that there's this story emerging where it looks like there is a population of women who might be particularly vulnerable to this risk. And it looks like that might be women, uh, for example, closer to the age of 16 years old, young women showing a greater propensity to uh, have uh, this association come to life. The other thing is that women using uh, forms of hormonal contraceptives that include only a progestin rather than this combined form with the estrogen and the progestin, they actually show a greater risk as well. So, of course, though, in 2021, a study had come out from Sweden in a large sample showing that there was absolutely no association between depression and hormonal contraceptives. And then, of course, there's this study in 2013 that continues to throw a wrench in everyone else's research that showed that there was a reduced effect of or, uh, sorry, reduced depressive symptoms in women using hormonal contraceptives. And so really, the jury is still out in the epidemiological literature. They are still hot at it, and I am not an epidemiologist. And so I backed off, and I turned to the neurobiological literature to try and find some putative link between depression and hormonal contraceptives. Now, sadly, I don't have enough time to present to you all of the different neurobiological changes that occur in a woman using hormonal contraceptives, but I will present to you the one that has received the most research, which is the link between cortisol, stress, and hormonal contraceptives. Cortisol is our main stress hormone. It comes, uh, or it's produced in the adrenal glands and released from the adrenal glands, and it's released in times of acute stress. A classic example, walking through the jungle, tiger jumps out of the bush, you want to get this big spike in cortisol levels. And this is really going to you know, pull glucose into your bloodstream and uh, direct blood flow to your major muscle groups in order, so that you could fight or flight if you really needed to. Now, uh, if you're exposed to cortisol over the long term, chronic long term exposure to cortisol, I mean, there's probably not a better group to uh, try and explain that that is not a good thing to. But if you're interested, I would uh, recommend reading the book Why Zebra Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky. It's a great place to start uh, in terms of connecting cortisol and health. In people with depression, you see that there's disrupted cortisol on a few different levels. So what you see first is that they have a blunted cortisol response. So when provoked with a stressor, 
someone with depression is not going to get, for the most part, is not going to get this big acute stress response, this big spike in cortisol. You see that they have a blunted cortisol response. In addition to that, they just sit at a higher elevated baseline of cortisol levels to begin with. People with depression just have more cortisol circulating through at any given time. They also show a dysregulated cortisol awakening response. When you wake up in the morning, for the first 15 or 30 minutes, you want to get this big spike in cortisol, and that's really going to kind of engage your faculties and get you ready to start your day. In people with depression, you don't see this. It's disrupted. It's dysregulated. So I'm sure you could see where the story is going here. What do we see with birth control? What do we see with hormonal contraceptives? Women with hormonal, or who take hormonal contraceptives, you could see that in this uh, figure here that, um, okay, so I'll walk you through this then. On the x-axis, we got two baseline measures of cortisol followed by two provocations with a stressor. And what you could see in the HC negative group, that's people without hormonal contraceptives on board, that they get this big spike in cortisol when provoked with those two stressors. What you see in the HC plus group, that's people who have HC on board, hormonal contraceptives, they don't get this rise in cortisol when provoked with a stressor. Now, another thing that you'll observe if you look, uh, there's this recent study that com came out showing that hormonal contraceptive users just sit at a higher baseline of cortisol levels. What you saw from this study was that hormonal contraceptive users had cortisol levels that were one standard deviation higher than their non-hormonal contraceptive using counterparts. This was actually, oh, a little box there to illustrate that for you. And, uh, this was actually replicated recently in a paper that was just came out last month showing that women in the follicular phase and luteal phase of their menstrual cycle had about half the circulating levels of cortisol compared to hormonal contraceptive users. This was associated with increased uh, scores on uh, questionnaires related to depression and stress, but not anxiety. Now lastly, the cortisol awakening response, of course. And so we get to the cortisol awakening response, and this is what a healthy one should look like. You get this spike in the morning, like I mentioned, and then after about uh, the first hour or so, you get this gradual decline throughout the rest of the day. And of course, in non-hormonal contraceptive users, that's exactly what you see. You see this rise in the morning, followed by that gradual decline in cortisol throughout the rest of the day. Okay, here we go. What do you see with hormonal contraceptive users? You get a roughly kind of blunted cortisol awakening response. They don't get this big spike in the morning. They kind of get this little rise and then it kind of tapers off from there, uh, actually more gradually than the rest, uh, than, than you'd observe in non-cycling, uh, or sorry, naturally cycling women. So all of this to say that we obviously see some connections between what we observe in a, depress a depressed population and then what we observe in a hormonal contra contraceptive using population. I'm not necessarily saying that this is the exact connection, but in a particularly vulnerable group of individuals, this cortisol dysregulation could be uh, what's kind of leading to this association that we're seeing with hormonal contraceptives and depression. In general, though, the science of hormonal contraceptives is just emerging now. This is a brand new field. And so since their release in 1960, when we flipped the menstrual cycle physiology on its head, we're still catching up as a science to figure out what kind of impact that might have had on women's brains. Hormonal contraceptives do impact the brain compared to never, uh, naturally cycling uh, women, but the results are subtle and they're mixed. There's no real clear direction yet as to where that's going. And that's likely due to the fact that most studies are just grouping all of these hormonal contraceptive users together and not accounting for the different ph pharmacological, pharmacological properties uh, within each unique formulation. That being said, unique types of hormonal contraceptives are going to produce unique types of effects. As I mentioned, there's different effects of antiandrogenic and androgenic hormones used in hormonal contraceptives. And then you saw that there's different risks of depression in combined users versus progestin-only users. So the type really, really matters here. So I don't want everyone to forget that while there's so many different unknowns about the brain and how hormonal contraceptives might affect it, they've, been, they've benefited women uh, in so many different ways. Uh, and so we really have to uh, appreciate that as well. Now, thank you all for your attention. And I'm, I'm actually going to skip this question slide because I have a little bit more time, so I'm going to plug a couple things. Um, I was associated with a um, journal, a special issue in a journal recently that uh, is going to be covering all of the different uh, 
research on hormonal contraceptives in the brain, and we're calling for translational research because we really don't know much about mechanisms here. And so really we're looking for animal work as well to try and decipher really what's going on at the level of the brain. And so if you're interested in uh, the stuff I presented to you today, I highly encourage you to uh, follow up with this special issue. It's being released as we speak. Another thing that I've planned recently in collaboration with a great team at the Women's Health uh, Research Cluster is a virtual conference that is entirely dedicated to hormonal contraceptives and brain health. And so we've got an amazing lineup of speakers of all of the world-class scientists from around the globe who are going to be speaking on this topic. And uh, now I will thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, I'd be more than happy to try and answer them for you. And uh, I'm... <laughs> It occurred to me that uh, these would be, uh, that this would offer some opportunity for very strate strategic use of, of these as a nootropic. And um, I was imagining, for example, a med student might want to take an androgenic version while they were taking the boards, and then when they're doing patient interview testing, they would take the, <laughs> the anti-androgenic version. I was wondering what you think of that, and, and if so, what would the what would the timing be? Would you use it as an acute dose the day of the <laughs> test, or would you want to take a preparatory lead-up, lead-in phase? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for your question, Chris. <laughs> Honestly, I think that the uh, literature is still too scarce in ter to make any, uh, I, I mean, I, I definitely don't think we should be using these things as cognitive enhancers until we have a bit <laughs> of a better understanding uh, of their function. But uh, yeah, I, too early for that. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. This was excellent. Um, having been on various forms of it, whether it was the pill or the newer ring, for a total of 24 years in which no one thought to take me off it, um, Initially, it was to protect my bones, even though I wasn't ovulating, you know, mm -hmm. using it. It was suppressing ov ovulation. I have been musing about um, the, the connection between, well, you see a higher resting cortisol in people who are taking it. Is that connected perhaps to like vagus nerve suppression, which might then play into like the development of dysbiosis, because that's something I've also had a lot. And I've heard from various sources that it plays a big role in, in the production or the development of dysbiosis. So there's not enough work done yet that I could say whether or not it actually is affecting vagal stimulation or not. Um, it could be, and I know that there is work that showed that uh, in general, women using oral contraceptives had uh, dysregulated microbiome, whatever that might mean, though, you know, um, in terms of, uh, yeah, uh, compared to naturally cycling women. I, again, I couldn't speak to the mechanism of that because it, it, the research is just lacking in a lot of ways. And, and it so, would be so hard to do a mechanistic it, study. It, it, exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. I don't know, again, I... Yeah, the gut connection is interesting, and there's a, a lab in Ottawa right now that's working on just that question, but uh, I think it's too early to say. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Canadian apologizing. <laughs> Hi, thanks for that. Um, so I guess my question is, I, I saw the, the blunted cortisol response. Um, would it, it, I, Basically, I've got this sort of image in my mind that, like, essentially the natural circadian rhythm itself is sort of messed up because of this, because of how much, uh, you know, cortisol and many other of these hormones are affected in that. And so I'm curious if there's been other studies around sleep and how sleep has been affected. There have, to be honest, I haven't read all of them. They're really kind of coming out in the last year, and I'm trying to wrap up my PhD. <laughs> but um, there are associations with increased insomnia in women using hormonal contraceptives. That's something I know. And that association with this insomnia is also associated with increases in depressive symptoms. Uh, that's basically all I know in terms of the sleep. Uh, there was one study that came out about sleep, uh, sleep architecture being different, but again, just because things are different between a naturally cycling woman uh, and a hormonal contraceptive user in the laboratory setting, 
when you walk out of it, would you be able to kind of spot that? I don't know. And so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have sort of an adjacent question, actually. It does have to do with cortisol. I know there's a connection between uh, cortisol and fat storage, particularly uh, belly fat. Um, and so I'm curious if you can speak to that at all. And then also, um, is there a connection between um, hormonal birth control and insulin resistance? Um, and there's a very particular example I'd like you to speak to, which is a friend of mine uh, was just told by her doctor that she is pre-diabetic, mm -hmm. even though she works out and generally lives a healthy lifestyle. Um, could hormonal contraceptives contribute to that? Okay. Um, well, in terms of the obesity thing, it depends on the progestin, because what you see is that with the androgenic forms, there does seem to be a bit of weight gain. And in rats that I've tested myself, giving them levonorgestrel is a... Um, they put on 30% more body weight. And giving them only ethanol estradiol, they lost 30% of body weight. So there does seem to be a uh, body weight effect, but again, it's uh, to be investigated further. Um, the second part about insulin resistance. So this is a little bit outside of my domain, uh, first of all. But second of all, I do think that there is an effect on insulin resistance, uh, especially because what you see is that women uh, are typically prescribed, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which do have disrupted insulin, they tend to be prescribed hormonal contraceptives in uh, combination with metformin. And so I, I can't speak to the mechanisms, but I do know that hormonal contraceptives, I think, are actually showing to be, depending again on the type that you're using, in some cases beneficial on insulin resistance. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jesse. One more question? Uh, yep. Yeah, we've got time. So with chronically elevated cortisol levels, do you see down regulation of cortisol receptors? That has not been tested yet, but that... You might, would expect that. You would expect that. That is, yeah, a very interesting question. To be honest, uh, you know, so I'm about to start my postdoc, and I think some of the questions that I have are these real basic questions where, you know, not only cortisol receptors, I want to see our estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors being, uh, like, you get a reduction in them when you introduce these potent steroid hormones. And so uh, the answer is still not there. There's one study that showed that uh, there was reduction in uh, estrogi uh, estrogen receptor alpha um, MR mRNA in the hippocampus with the introduction of levonorgestrel, but that is about it. So in postmenopausal women, the use of topical E2 mm -hmm. is at least anecdotally, and there's some data to support it, associated with improved cognition and improved sleep cycles. Yep. Totally different from birth control situation. I mean, estrogen in general is, I mean, it seems like a cognitive enhancer at some level. You know, that's why we give it to women, uh, postmenopausal women. And so... Uh, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a case that can be made for why we're observing these potential effects of improved cognition long term if you're giving a real potent estrogen. And there's also recent literature documenting a probable cause and effect relationship between decreased risk of cognitive impairment age over 60 and the duration of E2 replacement for postmenopausal symptoms. And sorry, what direction is the cognition going in? It's improved. Oh, yeah. Decreased risk of cognitive dysfunction as we age, as, as women age. And that's with giving a bioidentical? Bioidentical, bio topical to avoid the breast yeah. cancer or ovarian cancer issues. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks very much. Give Jesse a round of applause.